Hi, welcome to the EEV blog. I'm your host, Dave Jones, and this is episode number 17. Now, in a previous blog, I spoke about, um, well, I actually mentioned uh, findchips.com, which is a really handy website for um, searching for parts. It'll, you know, you type in the manufacturer's part number or a partial part number, and it'll find, uh, it'll search all the major manufacturers, you know, DigiKey, Mouser, Newick, and you know, a whole bunch of others, and it'll give you results of, you know, stock availability and price and all that sort of stuff, and it's fantastic. Now, um, since that blog, somebody else uh, put me on to um, octopart.com, and it's a similar sort of thing, but it's got some ads, and, you know, it's a bit busier, and, uh, but it basically does a similar sort of thing, and to findchips.com, and, you know, I really like it. It's not... It's not quite as good as findchips.com as far as our search results. Um, I found, you know, it, it actually uh, doesn't find some of the stuff that findchips.com does. Um, but it uh, searches um, some more obscure um, uh, actual suppliers and, um, and it actually returns a, the, the list is um, much better formatted than findchips.com. So, um, you know, so they really complement each other. So I find that, you know, pretty much every day now I'm, I'm using both uh, findchips.com and octopart.com. So um, check them out. They're really good. Recommend them. Now, over the years, I've had a lot of uh, young people um, ask for my advice on what's the best way to learn electronics. And, you know, to get a real good in-depth understanding of it, um, you know, is it um, through, uh, you know, self-study, actually reading books, or is it, uh, you know, building stuff? And, you know, um, my opinion is that you've got to have both. You've got to have that hands-on practical experience, and you've got to, you know, read up on the theory and just, you know, you have to be fairly well-grounded. But the biggest thing you can do, not only build stuff, but debug stuff. So here's my uh, wish for your next project. I hope your next project doesn't work. I hope you build it, you switch it on, and it does absolutely nothing. Why? Because you'll learn more than anything else about electronics when you have to actually debug a design. If you just uh, you know um, follow a circuit and you build it up and you know, and it works first go, you haven't really learnt much. You've learned how to solder or you've learned how to construct and you've learned how to wire things, but you haven't really learnt about electronics design. And debugging stuff, debugging the designs you build is one of the best things you could do, especially those really elusive problems that can take you days to track down or something like that. It is the best way to learn. So, next time, I hope your project doesn't work. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. It's time for another story from the bench. And this one happened to me uh, some time back. I was um, caught over to uh, actually debug a design I built. And, um, uh, you know, one of the uh, software guys was working on it, trying to get up and running, and we were having a weird problem with it. Right, so I do a basic uh, block diagram of what we were actually working on. Now, what it consisted of is a um, audio uh, chip, and it's a um, I2S um, output audio device, and we had an FPGA, and this had an internal processor, which was running some code, of course, and this was. Um, talking to the, it was trying to um, sample uh, audio data um, from the I2S chip. You know, it was um, sampling audio, converting it into a serial I2S data stream and feeding it into the FPGA. And um, what we found we were getting, well, it it wouldn't work at all. The um, software guy was going, oh, you know, it's, you know, he's coding here, he ported it from something else and there were no known problems with it and he was you know pretty sure it was actually a hardware um, fault you know he was a he was actually fairly cluey hardware wise and he was you know fairly sure he narrowed it down to a hardware fault so you know I I believed him when we started probing around and on one of the inputs here we actually measured and we actually um, 
got out a waveform which I'll I won't um, draw it here I've actually got a, um, a screenshot of the typical one and I'll, I'll show you that now now that waveform actually has the classic um, instead of being a um, you know a uh, if this is 3.3 volts and ground instead of being a, um, a complete uh, you know um, low voltage TTL signal that goes from 3.3 volts to ground it wasn't it was it looks like it was um, shorted to something else now um, that is a classic um, indication of a hardware problem okay we've, we've got a short on the board you know it was a it was a prototype board I think it was and so we were probing around trying to find shorts and uh, you know it it took us ages and we were you know trying to figure out um, why this thing and because it was an FPGA these inputs are all programmable we thought aha maybe the shorts actually occurring inside the FPGA something wrong with the FPGA design and you know the outputs are mapped and it's short it was very complex design it did other things as well and it's very easy to mix up the outputs and you know um, get errors like that so we couldn't actually find you know we took the board we looked at it under the microscope and we couldn't actually find any um, actual hardware shorts on the board but it was it was shorted out somewhere so we spent ages trying to you know figure out um, you know something wrong with the FPGA I told the software guy to go back and you know try and figure out what was happening in the FPGA he came back and said you know I can't find anything what is it and um, so we looked around a bit more and I looked I was scratching my head I was looking at this waveform that um, you know I, I knew it was shorted somehow and but we were driving the output like this and then um, we looked at the schematics for the chip and this was supposedly an input signal so we you know we're driving an input with a you know with what looks like short where is it shorted and it finally clicked after a while that aha uh -huh, on a lot of these devices um, not just I2S but you know all sorts of chips these days the pins can be used for dual purpose uh, they can be both inputs and outputs depending on what mode or something like that it's in so um, it, it so we checked out the um, circuit diagrams for it and it showed it was only an input but as it turns out I checked the data sheet I double checked and the data sheet sure enough this pin we were probing and getting the short on was both an input or an output depending on what mode you were actually in and this had another control line here I think it was an I squared C line and as it turned out uh, when this device powers up this is actually an output and it only becomes an input after you send the correct codes through to it to actually um, you know to actually switch it to an input so as it turns out it was a problem in the code in the processor that was driving the I squared C line a totally unrelated line setting up this chip and it hadn't set up this uh, pin properly as an input so we were so the um, FP another part of the FPGA design another part of the software was driving it this way and this was an output so we actually got this um, shorted like signal and this uh, pin just happened to output some clock signal or something like that that's why there was this um, clock signal superimposed on it so there you go that can be a real trap for young players just be careful of it next time just because a, um, a circuit diagram might show that the pins an input it may not or an output it may not be it might be dual purpose especially on microcontrollers and things like that these days so just be careful of it dual purpose pins they can be a pain in the butt and they can cause all sorts of heartache and take you hours to debug or days and you might think it's a hardware problem and it's not software dual purpose pins a bit evil but flexible